We have a young Indian with us, going to be a scholar, I think. Hello, everyone. It's good to be with you once again. Uh, today we have with us Anchal Kimtani. Let's listen to her. Over to you, Anchal. Thank you. Uh, I would first like to thank uh, Sir for giving this opportunity to me uh, so that I am able to share my experiences with all those who are watching this. And before I start with that, I think I would just give a little bit of introduction. So my name is Achal Kintani. I pursued my master's in economics. And then after that, as I was contemplating about what I should be doing, I thought it would be good to pursue teaching and research in economics. So I would like to start with, uh, uh, I would just start with a little bit of what I have done in terms of my educational attainment. And this would just give the process to anybody who is uh, maybe interested to work uh, in the same uh, themes and domains as I have worked. So in the entire process, I would also highlight what I have done over a period of uh, a couple of years. So uh, I would like to begin with the fact that I pursued my bachelor's in economics from Ramnarayan Bhuya College, which is located in Matunga, Mumbai, after which I did my postgraduate degree in economics, MA in economics, from the Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics in Pune. And uh, this is the time when I uh, it occurred to me that I should write the net and set examinations. And, and that is what I actually did. So I was in my master's itself. So uh, the way a master, uh, the master's program is structured at different universities is different. But for me, the case was most of the core papers were, were done by the third semester. And we had optionals like demography, labor economics, etc. towards the last semester. So that means most of the core uh, papers in economics were almost done by the third semester. And that is when I decided to write the University Grants Commission National Eligibility Test. Now, for those who might have not heard of this or for anybody who is unfamiliar with this, this is an examination that one takes uh, if one is willing to become an assistant professor or a researcher in economics. So we could say that this is a minimum. I would also like to highlight that this is the minimum eligibility. Passing this exam only makes sure that you are uh, eligible at the minimum level. But this is a, a necessity almost in most of the places if you are applying for, say, an assistant professor role. So it was the third semester of my MA program when I thought of writing this exam. And I would give uh, the credit to all my professors and the post, the curriculum and its delivery at my postgraduate program that I was able to qualify this uh, national eligibility test in my very first attempt during my master's with the junior research fellowship. So that made my, uh, that I, I, I think the qualification of this exam gave me a certain clarity as to what I should do with my career after my master's, because uh, as a master's student, one has two, uh, two different opportunities. One is to pursue academia, research and teaching, and the other is to go for college placements, which are decent. Uh, so having cleared the UGC net exam, I, uh, I mean, I gave a lot of careful consideration and with a number of dialogues with my teachers, with my professors, with my seniors, I decided that I would pursue academia, that means research and teaching. Okay. All right. Yeah, so, so, so please continue. So this is when I started uh, looking for PhD applications. I mean, it was, I did not uh, think that I would work for one year. I was directly looking for uh, openings for PhD programs after, after I uh, qualified the net exam. But then once I spoke to some of my seniors, they suggested that it would be actually better if I test uh, the fact that I'm comfortable or in liking with what I want to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. 
so this is when i thought that maybe i should and they were also they also uh, insisted me to think what i would be doing after my phd yeah so yeah so then i thought that i would be i would be better off or uh, it would be in line with my capabilities if i because i feel that i would be able to be a good professor yeah you know yeah this is when i started hunting for uh, i would say vacancies through all my networks be it uh, in verbally or through linkedin or maybe through some of my associations some of my professors i requested for letter of recommendations from uh, my professors and they were very kind to write these for me and uh, then i applied for a couple of positions and uh, i got i was very lucky to get selected as an assistant professor it this was on ad hoc basis but it was still a very good opportunity given the fact that i was a fresher straight out of my masters so i was selected uh, as an assistant professor in the department of economics symbiosis college of arts and commerce in pune yeah yeah and this is this is where i mean i would like to touch upon what topic i had submitted to speak on today so when i was asked to uh, deliver this uh, with paid i said i would talk on self discovery through work yeah so the reason why i call it self discovery through work is because i believe that there are a number of qualities or let's say attributes present within each individual that we fail to touch or fail to tap in our day to day life say as a student yeah but when we start working in a certain profession and given the work setup we are forced to tap uh, on those attributes and then there are moments of discovery when we actually discover certain attributes that we were unaware of and then that becomes a part of our identity yeah so that is what i call self discovery through work i think this happens in uh, each and every profession irrespective of the nature of work yeah and and this is a way in which your work or your profession enriches you as a human being yeah so since i uh, since i mentioned that i worked for one year uh, as an assistant professor and i was very young as compared to my cohort i had several moments of self discovery about myself and about others and these enriched me as a person and as i said one of my seniors had advised me to take up something so that i i am sure of the fact that i want to do this for the rest of my life yeah i am thankful for that advice because i had a very pleasant experience working for one year yeah so what was the discovery if i may ask yeah. that you if you want to share of course so i discovered that i can actually break concepts very well and i i had a good amount of self doubt before i had joined uh, and the self doubt was valid because i was a i was a fresher and i never really believed i knew that i knew something but i was uncertain of the fact that i would be capable enough to express it in such a way that others might understand what i am trying to say okay so i Uh, the moments of self discovery that i had were that i do have patience and that my self doubt is not complete the fact that i believed in my self doubt was wrong i mean i should have had a more positive uh, attitude towards my own self because i was able to do most of the things that i was expected to do mm. in a very good way i did get i did get good reviews from the students from the departments and as i said i was very uncertain if i should pursue this path or not that was mainly because of good amount of self doubt that i had about myself yeah. which i so i think uh, everybody should uh, uh, maybe have some trial or some test before actually stepping into something mm -hmm. and i was very lucky to get that opportunity yeah Well, you you were not though, you I just think. didn't get it. You obviously cleared the net. You obviously had the marks and yeah. the recommendation letters. It's not something that was just lying on the street and you picked it up. It was something that you worked hard for, right? So, and then you did a good job of it. So wonderful, and you yeah. cleared your own mind as to what you can do in teaching, right? So, and right. I'll tell you, it only gets easier as you go on. 
The first time is the hardest. And if you do well in the first one, then it's easy to become very good very quickly because all of us make mistakes in the first year and we all don't know what we are doing in the first year. It's hard. And then it becomes easier as you go along. So if you did a good job in the first year, I think it means you will do a better job later on. Happy, happy to hear that from you, sir. Yeah, we all make mistakes in the first year. We don't know what we are doing. And we just show up in class feeling very nervous and say, what, what am I supposed to do here? Right. How can I be clear in my expression? Because you really don't know uh, what will be clear to the students because you are already deeply into it. But they are not, and perhaps they're not as interested as you are. But still, you have to take them along, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a profession that requires a certain ability and you found out that you have it. So congratulations. I think after maybe working for 11 months, it occurred to me that, as I mentioned, that I qualified with the Junior Research Fellowship. That puts a constraint uh, on the time which is left for you to take admissions for a PhD program in the Indian context. Yeah. So uh, one year was already, uh, I mean, uh, for one year I worked. And then I also wanted to have a little bit of margin just for safety as a cushion in case if I don't get in. So I thought it would be better if I start applying for a, a PhD. And I, I also believe that I, as I was working, it was a full-time position, even if it was ad hoc. And it was very new for me. So I did not get, uh, I mean, I could not apply to a number of places. So for PhD, I mean. And then, but I made up my mind, uh, of course, with dialogue, I, in dialogue with my professor. So I, as I even mentioned towards the beginning, I think I am really thankful to some of the professors that taught me at my master's. And I would like to name them, Atriya ma'am. We had Hari sir, Amruta ma'am. These are very good people who have heavily influenced me. And in dialogue with them, I, uh, I then I made up my mind that I would apply for a, 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 like a PhD the next year. That means this year. Yeah. And then I applied at the same place where I did my master's from Gokhale yeah. Institute. Yeah. And I gave the interview. I presented my research proposal, and I have joined for the PhD program from the twenty eighth of this month. Our coursework is going on, which is going to be for one semester. We have courses on empirical modeling, research methodology, how we are supposed to write as researchers. So all that is ongoing. At the moment, I am at my place because this was the weekend and I had some uh, some work here, so I am back. But I would be traveling again tomorrow morning for the class. Okay, back to Pune. So your place means you are in Mumbai now, but you yeah. will be going back to Pune. Right, because we have class in the morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know, and you don't want to miss it, right? No. I don't okay. want to miss it. All right, great. So I know you have uh, prepared some slides. You want to show them right. now or you want to talk yes. about something else? I think I would present the slides now. Okay, let's do it. Yes. So I'm sharing my screen. I hope it is visible. Yeah, okay. Just make it big, full screen. Yes. Is it okay? Yeah. So this is for anybody who wants to pursue a risk of like a PhD or anybody who is watching maybe during their master's or even if they're pursuing an undergrad. I have just highlighted some of the steps and I would be speaking on these. So the first thing that you need to uh, have is an undergrad undergraduate degree. For example, in my case, it was a BA in economics. I would also like to highlight that this is a time when a person should be preparing for entrance tests because you would be required to write these entrance tests if you want to get into a good postgraduate degree. Yeah. The second step is your MA or MSc in economics, so your postgraduate degree. And uh, I would like to highlight that the University Grants Commission National Eligibility Test calls for a score of at least 55% uh, at your master's level. So make sure that 
uh, anybody who would like to pursue something of this sort should at least make sure that you are able to get 55% at your MA level. Yeah. During the masters, I think this is the best time when, because everything that you read is very fresh and then you don't forget a lot. So I think anybody who is serious about pursuing teaching or research should write the university grants commission national eligibility test or the state eligibility test. So this national eligibility test is often called the net and then the state eligibility test is called the set. I would just take a minute to highlight the difference between the two. The national eligibility test happens at the all India level and then the state eligibility test happens at the state level. Also, there is no provision for a fellowship if you want to pursue PhD in case if you write the set, but that provision is there if you clear net with JRF. Okay. So net with JRF is the way to go if you can do it. Yeah. Okay. If you can, uh, I think it is always uh, the ideal thing if you have the junior research fellowship. But if you do not have the junior research fellowship, you can talk to uh, the coordinators of your PhD program and they may introduce you to other fellowships, which might be uh, so in some case, which you might be lucky to get. Okay. So if in case if you still do, like if you have set or just net and if you have obtained a PhD admission, it is always wise to speak to your PhD coordinators and they can then maybe suggest based on your situation, some other fellowships which can help you. Okay. Then uh, a qualified candidate, uh, I mean, anybody who has cleared the net or the set can do, uh, is that person can be open to assistant professor jobs or that person can apply for PhD programs in India. If you go for A, that means if you intend to apply for assistant professor positions, you would have to go for a couple of rounds of interviews. Generally, these are two. I mean, two rounds. One round is uh, uh, for your personality and the other round is for your subject knowledge. This differs from place to place, university to university, but in the Indian context, which is what, uh, which is, uh, I mean, I am only speaking of the Indian context because I only have knowledge of that. So if you go uh, for the option A, that means if you apply for an assistant professor position, you would go through a couple of rounds of interviews, which was two rounds in like, uh, which is generally two rounds. And then, and in these interviews, the intent is to actually test some soft skills, which are required in the class. And they would also thoroughly test your subject expertise, mm -hmm. which I which would not become very difficult given the fact that you've qualified net. Yeah. And then the other option straight after your master's is B. So B is you can apply for PhD programs in India. You can apply for research. So what you would be required to do in, so in most cases, if you've cleared net and set or any of, uh, of the two, you would be exempt from the written test in most cases. And then you will have to prepare and present a research proposal on your area of interest. It is always advisable if you can speak to your advisor before the interview and obtain feedback if it is uh, feasible. And then uh, the interview for PhD dif would differ greatly from the interview for an assistant professor because the option B, that means an interview for PhD programs would strictly be limited. I mean, in very rare cases, would they ask anything from the subject? And if they do, that would also be very specific and not general as such. Okay. So the interview would try to gauge your research aptitude more than your subject expertise. Yeah, you've come so far. So you are already knowing the subject. Now the question is, do you really have the ability and interest to do research. I think that's fair. Right. So I think uh, the slides, uh, these are the two slides that I have prepared and I will right. uh, stop sharing my screen so that we go back to the... Okay. All right, here we are. Right. Well, thank you. That is a very helpful uh, flow chart. It tells us exactly. And I'm just, uh, first time I'm seeing such a flow chart and it just shows that you have put in a lot of thinking and effort to simplify and make it clear. And I hope 
uh, younger people will benefit from it and make. But why don't you talk about yourself now a little bit more than you've done so far? It's been very process oriented. But let's get Achal oriented now. Let's find out who you are. <laughs> so I, uh, I mean, I would not call myself or class my, classify myself as an introvert as such. But uh, before I started working, I was very, I mean, I was in a shell maybe. I was not the kind of person who was very friendly. I, I mean, I am not that even now. But I always doubted my uh, expression. And I was not very people-centric. So that is what I think I am even now. As such, I think I don't have a lot of hobbies. But I think what I like to do is I like to sat uh, get maximum satisfaction from what I do. Because that is one of the elements that gives me happiness. So a lot of my time, even for the last year, went uh, away in planning for the class. And now it goes, uh, I mean, I spend most of the time in, uh, in, the, like, in the class and then maybe studying after the class because after, like these six months is when we are supposed to finalize our proposals, set our objectives straight and then start working. So, and then having uh, conversations with our uh, guides and uh, advisors, asking for their feedback. So that is what I am engaged into. And uh, since this is the weekend, sometimes I think I spend some time uh, doing uh, such uh, like something of this sort so that it helps anybody who might be interested in these uh, kind of things. Yeah, it certainly is certainly helpful. Uh, but uh, what is coming across, you know, you can't be an introvert if you are teaching college students because these college students will want to talk to you. They just know, it. just as you are talking to your professors, for them, you are their professor and they will talk to you. So how hard, how can it be that you don't talk to them? You have to talk to them. Isn't it the case? Right. Is it, so, it is very true. And I think maybe given the fact that I was almost their age, I used to teach undergrad programs. Yeah. Because I forgot to mention actually during the flowchart that if you do not have a PhD or if you are not enrolled for a PhD, you cannot actually teach master's students. Yeah. Unless it's a visiting uh, faculty thing, which yeah. is also rare in most of the cases. Yeah. So I was teaching undergrad students and uh, they were very close to my age. So I actually had a very friendly, uh, I believe at least, yeah. I had very uh, friendly kind of uh, a relation with them. And they yeah. also appreciated the fact huh. that I was uh, open to any kind of doubts that they had up, uh, in the class. Oh, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. All right. So anything else you want to add here? Uh, words of wisdom or some co-curricular activities you did in Ruya, even though you said you were not extrovert? Uh, what did you do to enjoy life at that time? Something like that. Anything on your mind? Uh, we used to have, uh, I mean, I was in the student committee. We used to organize. I was in the fine arts committee. And we used to help in organizing. This is when I was in Ruya. Yeah. We used to organize or help, I would say, in organizing college uh, activities. So I was a part of that. And uh, we used to maybe raise fund or uh, look at the logistics, whatever necessary. So I was a part of that yeah. when I was at uh, uh, during my bachelor's. But yeah. my master's was, I think, more focused because I was little tense as to what I would be doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not much of activity during my master's, but a little bit of that I did do when I was doing my BA in economics. Okay. All right. Final question from me. How do you like Pune as a city? Uh, I think I I really like Pune as a city, given the fact that I like I like the climate or the weather. I would say because it is very pleasant, very livable. I think I do like Pune as a city. On a scale of 1 to 10, maybe I would give 8, 8 and a half, 9. So I do like the city. And I mean, do you prefer to live here or to in Mumbai? I mean, you grew I, up there. You grew uh, up in Mumbai. So how is it to you? Is it a small city with a down? How do you find it? 
I think I would say that uh, it is better in Pune, it, especially for a student. I think because you have a lot of educational institutes very close to each other, and given the fact that a lot of students travel to Pune, you can have many people of your age group, and then you make very good friendships. So that is something that. For a student, I think Pune is better. Okay. And as I said, yeah. All right. Anything else you want to add, or should we end it here today? I think uh, I don't want to add anything else. I think we can end. Okay, fine. Maybe we'll be back to you in a year to see how you are doing in your PhD. Are you still keen to do it, and how you are doing? Let us know. We'll see in one year or so how things are going with you. But for the moment, let's say bye to the viewers. And thank you, Achil, for being so honest and so clear and so transparent about how it goes, what it takes, who you are. Uh, it's really good of you to share that with us, though you say you are an introvert, but you have shared that you are an introvert with us. So thank you so much. And let's say bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.